Um, but let's move on through the news because, of course, the other big hit at the moment is what's happening in the financial world. Uh, so, uh, David, let's start off with pensions. All right. Um, so this is uh, a sort of segue from uh, MHRA in a way. Uh, the Financial Times reports that uh, the plan is to raise UK state pension age to 68. It's going to be delayed uh, due to falling life expectancy. Why, I wonder, is life expectancy falling? Uh, now, the political aspect of this explaining is that they've, they've removed the cap um, for very well-paid people having uh, pension contributions. It's no longer limited, tax-free uh, at a million. It's essentially unlimited now. Um, and to, in the same week, um, announce uh, the ordinary working people are going to have to work longer before receiving the state pension um, was going to play badly. So the Conservative government have decided to uh, push that back to after the election uh, for entirely political reasons. Uh, but two things here. One, the state pension is currently sitting at 100 uh, billion uh, expenditure. It's going to go up to 140 billion. And... Um, this is um, creating huge strains on the state to pay for this. Um, they are being forced to make the state pension age later and later. Um, that's going to create political problems. But uh, I thought the most interesting part of that is the fact that um, life expectancy is falling. And there's no, apart from COVID, pointing at COVID, there's no explanation or study or analysis as to why. Nobody seems to care. Uh, indeed, that is a very good point. Uh, so let's uh, then move on to inflation, of course, because this is the big financial news of the day. Now, we've got to remind ourselves that Rishi Sunak has made one of his five great plans uh, to half inflation. So having inflation this year uh, to ease the cost of living, this is his aim uh, in the run up to the next general election. So, well, is he succeeding? Well, perhaps not. Here's the latest statistics from the uh, Office for National Statistics and the Consumer Prices Index rose to 10.4% uh, in the 12 months to February uh, 2023 from 10.1% in January. So that is making the government and the Bank of England a bit sad, maybe. Uh, the Consumer Prices Index, including owner-occupiers housing costs, that's CPIH, uh, rose by 9.2% in the 12 months to February 2023 up from 8.8% .8 in January. So these are just two different me measures of inflation. Um, here's the main reason for it. Uh, so this graph, uh, the light blue line, shows food and non-alcoholic beverages. And we can see that the inflation rate for food, which remember everybody needs, we can't live without it, is now just under 20%, it's about 18.1% or so. This is uh, well above the headline rate of, uh, of 10%. Uh, and uh, completely ridiculous. Uh, but in the meantime, energy uh, is the other main driver. Uh, and the light blue, these are, this is uh, uh, various measures of household expenditure. And the light blue, this sort of turquoise color, is energy. Uh, and you can see that the proportion of energy uh, as a, you know, is, is huge compared to other household expenditure. And that David, is very, very strange because if we look at the wholesale prices of energy, let's just look, run through a few graphs here. So here's the day ahead price because remember you buy energy in the future. So if we're buying energy uh, tomorrow, this was the, the, the graph uh, from the 21st of uh, March uh, for the day ahead price for wholesale gas. Well, we can see that it's actually fallen quite significantly from the highs of August, of, of, uh, August last year, August, September last year. But we're not seeing that in the inflation figure. So the retail price isn't coming down uh, it, at the rate that the wholesale price has been coming down. If we look at the uh, price of uh, gas for, if you want to buy gas for summer 2023, very similar picture, well off the highs of uh, August last year. Uh, same for buying gas for winter 2023. So what is the energy company's excuse for this? Let's look at electricity. And it's, exa it's exactly the same picture. The highs of August last year were well, well below those. Uh, but yet the uh, energy uh, inflation is still a major driver of inflation. Uh, if this is for summer 23. If you're buying electricity for summer this year, uh, well down from the highs of last year. And if you're buying from for winter, 
Um, so that's an issue that needs to be dealt with. And uh, it's very, very common amongst energy, whether it be household energy of gas and electricity, or in fact, uh, you know, oil based energy for your you know, petrol for your car, whatever. They're very quick to put the prices up. They're very slow to bring the prices back down again at the retail level. And of course, the excuse that they use is, well, when we bought the energy for April, May 2023, it was at those peaks. Um, I'm sorry, I don't buy it. But anyway, we can talk about that a bit more in a second. Here's what Jeremy Hunt had to say. Inflation itself is itself destabilizing. It's not an answer to say we're suddenly going to change our minds and say that it's acceptable to have a rate of inflation that is as destabilizingly high as 10%. Uh, he said the speed of interest rate rises is the root of the cause of the volatility we've seen in recent months. Uh, I, and then speaking about the governor of the Bank of England, I only ever say to him, please do what you think is necessary as you're legally bound to do under the Bank of England Act. So there you go, David. Uh, energy prices, food, the key uh, elements in the rise in inflation. But don't worry, when the Bank of England decides that it's going to raise interest rates tomorrow, it's because it's legally obliged to uh, under the Bank of England Act. Uh, but, uh, you know, what was he saying? The speed of interest rate rises is the root cause of the volatility. Nothing to do with the speed of money printing. Oh, no, nothing to do with the speed of money printing. Nothing to do with their policy over COVID, the reaction, the policy reaction to the COVID um, issues um, and nothing to do with the vast creation of money. And they're, they're caught out again. A couple of quick points on that. The head of the Bank of England is formally a civil servant uh, and he does report to the Treasury Department. So the oversight that the government's given the Bank of England is, you do what you like, lads. It's, whatever it is, it's fine with us. Really? Really? That's, that's the oversight? That's a little bit alarming. And the people they're giving this power to who don't appear to know why inflation's uh, happening, don't appear to be able to predict it, uh, just looking at their their Twitter account, they didn't even mention mm. that inflation went up. It's not on the Twitter account, but they do say at their sort of banner headline of who we are as the bank of, as the UK's central bank, we work to ensure low inflation, trust in banknotes, and a stable financial system. So there we go. That's the team we're following, right? They can't even have a Twitter banner that doesn't act that's so inaccurate. That isn't so inaccurate. It's actually funny. Yes. OK, thank you for that, David. Well, just to rubble this in a bit, I, I thought it would be good just to have a little look at the Treasury itself to get a feel for it. So here's part of their uh, home page. HM Treasury is the government's economic and finance ministry, maintaining control over public spending, setting the direction of the UK's economic policy and working to achieve strong and sustainable economic growth. Um, I've got a question here. We'll just throw it into the air because we haven't got the time to answer this. But the question is, does the Treasury control the issuing and supply of money? If not, who does? Uh, but here's a bit more of the Treasury. So um, they list out their responsibilities, priorities, objectives, who we are, corporate information. Um, we can't cover much today within the news, but I thought it'd be worthwhile to pop up responsibilities. So we've got public spending. Uh, we've got financial services. We'll put an arrow for that one, including banking and financial services regulation, financial stability, ensuring the competitiveness of the city. So we're going to look after the city corporate system, but we're also going to protect the country. Uh, with regard to financial services policy. You might say there's a conflict of interest there. Uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, delivery of infrastructure projects across the uh, public sector, ensuring the economy is growing sustainably, which, of course, it must be not at the moment. Uh, priorities here, strong and sustainable growth, reducing um, deficit, rebalancing the economy. It's all great language. Let's just pick out creating stronger and safer banks here. So this uh, this looks good. We can trust these people. Um, so we've got a bit about what we do here, which we've covered, but also um, the Treasury is a ministerial department supported by no less than 15 agencies and public bodies. So we might like to know who supports the Treasury. 
Um, this is just a taster for our audience because here's some of the things listed. So we've got the actuaries department. You want control of the figures so that you can skew what the public believes in any way you like. We've got the internal audit agency. That's so you can cover up what you're doing in the first place. Uh, but let's just bring the arrow in again because, oh my goodness, we've got something to do with money. Uh, so there's the Royal Mint Advisory Committee and there's also the Royal Mint. Uh, but of course, the coins are a fraction of the so-called money in circulation. Uh, so we're not too sure who's controlling the money at this stage. And I just couldn't resist this one, uh, the Bank of England, which you're really highlighting here. But it says the UK's bank resolution framework has a clear statutory order in which shareholders and creditors would bear losses in a resolution or insolvency scenario. So that's what the Bank of England says, but I wasn't able to easily find what the detail of that statement was. But we'll be coming on to that in more uh, detail for future UK column news is. David. Yes, I mean, we're covering this obviously Monday, but we talked about using a Bank of England document to illustrate it, how money creation works and the fact that 97% of broad money is created by the commercial banks. And that is controlled by the Bank of England. And the bank, this is what the Bank of England says about itself. It says, we are wholly owned by the UK government. The capital of the bank is held by the Treasury Solicitor on behalf of HM Treasury. Although we are owned by HM Treasury, we carry out our responsibilities independently. Figure that one out. All right, well, hold we on. Just before you move on, David, let's just figure that one out because let's not forget that was the very first act of Tony Blair when he became prime minister. Yeah, yeah, that was Gordon Brown's trust us because you can't trust us, but you can trust the Bank Tr of England, so we'll make them independent. Trust. Uh, I said, we're free, and they, they go on, we're free from day-to-day -day political influence, okay? So, okay, they also say, um, we're publicly owned. We are a public body that must answer to the people of the UK through parliament. So they must answer to the people of the UK through Parliament, but they're free from political influence. I'm not sure how that works. They're owned by the state, but they're completely independent of the people who own them. I'm not sure how that works either. And um, I, and they don't seem to get it right very often. Uh, we are sure how that works. Yes, indeed. OK, we'll we'll follow this through in more detail but uh, yeah i think the picture's becoming clear because the picture is so murky of what these people do and say they do okay if you like what the uk column does you'd like to support us uh, please head over to community.ukcolumn.org uh, there are options to help us out there now uh, we just like to say we are going to uh, uh, put the membership fees up uh, in may uh, but uh, not for current members so if you join between now and the 1st of May, then you'll join at the current rate and stay on the current rate. So maybe this is a good time to join. Indeed. And we'd just like to say that uh, we haven't changed our um, annual, uh, annual or monthly subscription for over 10 years. And uh, we think it's time that we did that. So we're, we're making that statement now. OK, thank you. And uh, or you can pick something up at the UK Column shop. But please do share uh, anything you find on the various platforms. And don't forget the UKcolumn.org website itself. And also just remember also that uh, Kenny is busy push pushing out extracts from UK Column programming at uh, ukcolumnextracts.co.uk. So if you want to share it on the various social media platforms, uh, please head over there and have a look at uh, what he's doing. OK, well, Debbie, perhaps you'd just like to give your good self a little bit of a plug because your blog, as always, is doing great work. Oh, well, thank you for that. Yes, my blog um, is a lot of the stories that sometimes I can't cover on the news. This week, I'm looking at pharmacists, community pharmacists, who they are. Do you know who you're talking to when you go into a pharmacy? Do they know who they're talking to? I mean, community pharmacists seem to be replacing GPs. So that and much more in my blog this week, including you might get a bracelet now to just warn you that you could be having a heart attack in the near future. Doesn't that sound reassuring? Excellent. OK, thank you for that, Debbie. Also a reminder about AV13. Uh, we've got the main hotel event for the day, the 22nd of October. 
2023, so later this year, but also um, coming up 23rd of April, we've got the AV online and of course UK column assisting the AV team in both these key events. So if you haven't got a ticket and you'd like to take part, I suggest you get onto the AV13 website because those tickets are going very quickly. Now, um, a little while ago, I did uh, two interviews, or was it three interviews? I can't remember now, with a wonderful lady called San Sandy Adams, who was talking about the dangers of Agenda 2030. Many people have contacted the UK column to say, did we realise the good work that uh, Sandy had done recently at a council meeting in Glastonbury? We were fully aware. We've got a little video clip to share with our audience, but I'm also delighted to say that Sandy's agreed to come on and discuss what happened with the UK column uh, in a near uh, future UK column news. So let's have a look at a little bit of uh, what she did on that special day uh, two days ago. So we, we have no, no uh, LTN, plans for LTN. Now this council has never debated, it's never come up, 15 minute cities, 20 minute neighborhoods, 15 minute neighborhoods. We've never debated it, we've never had it on the agenda. As far as I'm aware, it's not going to be put forward as an agenda item anytime soon. Yeah, I'm quite, I'm quite happy to speak for the Lib Dems on this one. And as far as I know, Somerset County Council has not uh, endorsed it. There was one, one of our members who seemed to recall a long time ago that the previous administration had done it, but he could be mistaken. It's quite easy. It's quite easy. Long, no, long time ago, memory. We've got, we've got. No, no. no. <laughs> so we have, we have an ex, we have an ex Somerset County Councillor here who would know. And uh, if Terry would know. I can tell you that the first thought I heard about 15 minute uh, cities was about, I don't know, fortnight ago. And I thought, what on earth is that all about? Uh, it certainly was not debated uh, at our last, at the uh, last millennium. Uh, so um, I, I can tell you that it's nothing at all to do uh, for, from the last millennium. Whether it's going forward now, no. I, I don't know. And we're being told no. So. Please, uh, please adhere to that. That's all I can tell you. Well, we we represent we represent the people of Glastonbury. If the people of Glastonbury don't want 15-minute cities, then we represent that, don't we? That's what we're here for. Yeah. Right. Well, if we don't, you know what to do next time there's an election, don't you? So, Sandy, would you like to speak next? <laughs> I got it. And uh, thank you, and thank you. Um... Um, well, Leela's covered um, a lot of what I was going to speak about, which is great, because it, it, it leads me to look at the bigger picture. And yes, um, it's great that, that uh, I couldn't find anything in Mendip District Council about 15-minute cities, but it's important that we know about them. And it's important that we know about low, um, you know, the, the, the low emission um, uh, zones that they, they want to implement in uh, smaller, smaller towns. So what I'm just saying is... Um, Basically, this ideology isn't a, a grassroots, the whole 15-minute city ideology is not a grassroots initiative. It's actually a global initiative. Um, and it was brought in by um, Boris Johnson, uh, Michael Bloomberg and Carlos Moreno in 2004. Well, there we are, a little taster clip. Um, that uh, video is, uh, it can easily be found on YouTube, but Sandy Adams did a great job of telling those people what the agenda was really about. Uh, as I've just said, we, we will have a, as a guest on UK Column to talk about it in detail. But what a wonderful lady, not only talking, but walking the walk to go with it. So we're going to say, well done. Now let's move on to what I think is really unpleasant stuff and that is that the British government has decided that it's going to uh, provide uh, Ukraine not only with the, the Challenger tanks but also with the depleted uranium uh, shells to go with them. So the BBC News here, UK defends sending you uranium shells after Putin warning. What are we really talking about here? We're talking about depleted uranium 
effectively toxic in its own right, but when it's fired as a munition, it vaporizes and the dust is very toxic indeed. Radiation, relatively small, but it's uh, toxic, very toxic, and has caused huge problems in the Middle East. And now Britain is to supply this ammunition. And what is it ultimately going to do to destroy lives and pollute the environment in Ukraine? But the BBC that's busy trying to play this down at the moment, if we jump back to 2006, uh, we've got a BBC report, depleted uranium risk ignore. U UK and US forces have continued to use depleted uranium warnings despite, sorry, de depleted uranium weapons despite warnings they pose a cancer risk. And in this report, which I encourage viewers to find and read, it talks about um, uh, a senior UN scientist said research showed how depleted uranium could cause cancer, but that report was withheld. Of course, the UK Ministry of Defence said there was nothing wrong with it. Um, but in fact, many years ago, if uh, you remember, Mike, I certainly do, we met a, um, a former uh, UK soldier who'd been a machine gunner. His hands were in an appalling condition with the skin uh, very dry, cracks all over his hands and his, his particularly his fingers. And when we asked him about this, he said it was the result of depleted uranium dust, which covers the hands of gunners who use it in smaller cal caliber rounds. So the BBC has forgotten about environmental protection. It's OK to pump in the depleted uranium to Ukraine to destroy lives and to, to destroy countryside effectively. Um, this is how bad it gets with the BBC, because if you go looking for the story. Um, we've got the Challenger tanks, but really nothing credible. So, uh, Mike, I don't know what you think about it. I'm always speechless now with the BBC because it's such a disgraceful organisation. Yeah, well, we should never forget the, the degree of birth defects that were caused by effectively creating a blanket of depleted uranium across Iraq. So we're going to do that across Ukraine as well. Is this what we do to our allies, Brian? Uh, well, it's it's very clear that the Ukrainian, the lives of Ukrainians are seen as just sacrificial puppets for the agenda of UK and the US. And if they get killed on the battlefield, that's not a problem. If we destroy their families, because that's what's going to happen with depleted uranium, that isn't a problem for the BBC or the British government or the UK Ministry of Defence. Let's have a look at the situation, uh, just one aspect of the situation of the war in Ukraine. A very big thank you here to Brian J. Balletic, who's a former US Marine who's doing very good analysis. Uh, this is a time lapse of uh, what the Russians have been doing around Bakhmut, the key fortified city. So let's just run this through. And the thing that you will notice is that the Russian advance is continuing at pace, albeit it's being done by small chunks at a time. So here's the reality of what the Russians are doing. And this is the position of Bakhmut. Here's the uh, Kiev Independent again saying, as Wag <coughs> excuse me, as Wagner's offensive in Bakhmut likely nears culmination. They know what's happening. They know that the Russians are going to take Bakhmut. Bakhmud falls, Avdivka falls. Those are the two key strongholds. But at the moment, we don't want to discuss the reality in UK because it doesn't fit the propaganda. Uh, here's another graphic from Il Russo 12. And uh, what it's showing is Bakhmud as a city and who controls what. So early this morning, the figure was Russians were in control of 63% of the city. The Ukrainians, 17 percent, and the rest is no man's land. Uh, but the BBC and the Ministry of Defence would have us believe that nothing is happening. Let's look at this uh, interview clip with uh, Major General Chip Chapman, who's giving his opinion on what he sees as reality in Ukraine. Logistics are cut off. That plays into this thing, that it plays uh, into the psychological part of war when an army is pretty easy to collapse if you do those sorts of things. Hi, as ever, welcome, Chip. What, what's your latest up-to-date thoughts tonight on the state of the war, on the ground in Ukraine? Well, there's really not that much change on the ground, and I think we're almost getting to the point where the Russian forces 
culminate. Now, culmination from a military perspective is when your offensive power has been exhausted and you can go no further. Mm. That is a critical moment which would allow Ukraine at a place and time of its own choosing to go on the offensive. Now, I don't think the weather allows that to happen at the moment. It may be that certain other battles will need to be extended at Bakhmut along that part of the line to enable that to occur. But it seems to me that Ukraine are holding the line and the task and purpose, the hold is a mission verb, that's the task, and the purpose of that is to finally blunt the Russian offensive to allow the conditions where Russia, uh, where, sorry, Ukraine can take the offensive. Yes. And that really plays in, I think, John, to the deep strike we saw today in Crimea, because the difference really between the uh, Russian deep strike is that the Russian deep strike focuses on the civilian infrastructure of Ukraine to try and break the will of the civilians. Yes. It hasn't worked in the first winter and won't. Whereas the Ukrainian deep battle focuses on degrading the military potential of Russia and therefore setting the conditions for counterattacks, including uh, in that region, the, uh, the, the the attack in Crimea would be to uh, to come through probably Zaporizhia and sever the land uh, the land corridor between the forces in Kherson and those to the uh, east of that. Well, unfortunately, we haven't got much time in the news today to do the full analysis on, on what uh, the Major Gen General said. But um, if he saw a piece of coal, he would describe it as white uh, because his analysis of the battlefront is 180 degrees out to the reality. We've seen the Russian advances. The Russians move as quickly as they want to. At the moment, Ukrainian casualties as a minimum 250,000 dead, and that is a very low estimate. The Russians are controlling the battlefield. The Ukrainians are running out of ammunition. Their front is beginning to crumble. And what is coming out of this man's mouth for the, the, the public in UK? Absolutely outrageous. I'll do some more analysis on what he said uh, on Monday for you. But just to illustrate, let's have a look at defence uh, intelligence here. Over recent days, Ukrainian forces initiated a local counterattack. That's all it was, a few tanks and a few men to the west of the Donetsk Oblast, town of Bakhmud, which is likely to relieve pressure on the H-32 supply route. No, all the supply routes are cut. Fighting continues around the town centre and the Ukrainian defence remains at risk from envelopment. It has been encircled. However, there is a realistic possibility that the Russian assault on the town is losing the limited momentum it had attained. This, this is um, absolute, I've described it as mind-numbing misinformation from the UK Ministry of Defence. This is propaganda on a scale I could not believe. Uh, put all of this in context, let's have a look at that fantastic Irish MP, Claire Daly, and uh, what she had to say. Uh, in the European Union. Listening to the cheerleading in here, safe and secure, thousands of miles away from the front lines, I think it would be a useful exercise for us to remind ourselves about what ordinary Ukrainians are experiencing. The Economist reports of forced recruitment across the country. Draftees with no experience, or training are being sent to the front in what a UK minister calls first world war levels of attrition. Casualty figures are secret, but we know there are estimates of about 120,000. Battalion commanders tell the Washington Post of recruits fleeing positions en masse. Politico record reports a crackdown on deserters. These are human beings. And there is a shameful lack of empathy for ordinary people in the war rhetoric in here. The debate is about keeping the weapons flowing to keep the war going. Ukraine is burning through a generation of men, sons, husbands, brothers who can never be replaced. This cannot go on indefinitely. And ye sickening war generals who sit in here and will these men to our debts, you make me sick. We need peace, we need dialogue, however unpleasant that may be. 
Well, what a fantastic woman, and doesn't she put the, or very many will say, of the politicians, wherever they are in the UK, the EU, or the US, to shame. Okay, let's move on to this, uh, this wonderful image being pushed out by the UK government today. Uh, they have launched today their roadmap for reaching a tech superpower status. So we're going to become superpowers uh, in technology in the UK by 2030 through a new international technology strategy. And the first thing they say is it's all about tackling malign influence, uh, disinformation, that kind of thing. Uh, this is uh, James Cleverly and Michelle Donnellan have jointly launched this. Uh, it's going to support UK technology at home and abroad, uh, and it's going to map a road to become a to the UK becoming a technology uh, superpower by 2030. So let's uh, have a look at uh, this. They say uh, last week's publication of the Integrated Review Refresh identified that authoritarian regimes are using technology as a tool of oppression with far-reaching consequences for the security and prosperity of the British people. Well, let's just consider authoritarian regimes. First of all, which authoritarian regimes are they talking about? Are they talking about themselves? Uh, no, of course, they're talking about China. And of course, China uh, being kicked off the uh, uh, UK's telecoms network, because as, we, as we've made the point, we'll make it again in a second, uh, intelligence agencies using this network, uh, du dual use, uh, also, uh, the concern of Chinese companies involved uh, with uh, police surveillance and so on. Uh, but let's just r remind ourselves of the point about dual use. We, the UK will ensure that we embed dual use at the heart of everything, uh, including, uh, so that, including intelligence and security services uh, and with commercial users. So uh, um, uh, sorry, military and civilian infrastructure being uh, used by both types of agency. Um, but let's consider this idea of, a, uh, of a, an authoritarian regime and remind ourselves that uh, our own regime is busy pushing through new legislation, uh, which will allow, allow bulk data collection, data sharing without consent, including across borders, uh, and the increasing use of AI te technology to surveil and so on uh, members of the British public. Uh, let's not forget the rollout of the, the new digital pound. Uh, and well, Brian Dewey, as we were basically hinting out at the beginning of the program, uh, suggest that uh, perhaps mRNA technology, which the UK is so keen to uh, uh, promote and push uh, at the moment, is being used against its own population. Is that uh, is well, that an unfair statement? Well, I think that's a completely fair statement. Mike. Um, and so just to finish this little uh, segment off, then let's just uh, bring James Cleverly on screen. Uh, here he is with the uh, Israeli foreign minister today. And uh, well, what are they doing? They are uh, launching uh, the UK, the 2030 roadmap for UK is really bilateral relations. This is security, defense, all kinds of things. But with respect to technology, uh, this is what they had to say. Launching the UK Israel tech gateway is one of the things that they will do to increase the number of high growth Israeli tech firms setting up substantial operations in the UK. The Tech Gateway will support regional and sector-based alliances in the UK, building on the launch of the Pan-Northern UK-Israel Health Tech Gateway. Uh, the Tech Gateway will also explore further opportunities across a number of sectors, such as automotive manufacturing in the Midlands, energy and smart mobility in the West Midlands, but get this, cyber security in Cheltenham uh, and fintech in London. I, I would like to know, Brian, are they going to base these Israelis in GCHQ? Is that They're what They're already saying? there, Mike. They're already there because uh, we, we reported many years ago the, uh, the fact that the government had, had uh, brought together in partnership the intelligence, um, intelligence services from Israel and a particular unit. I think it's, it's something like Unit 4. Uh, 4200. I'll check up on that, but they're already there. And we know from uh, people who have uh, had experience uh, with GCHQ that there seem to be uh, a, a very um, comfortable relationship with data flowing seamlessly from the UK side to Israel. Um, not so much back again, however. David. Well, it's. Um... We didn't manage to get it on the news today, but a very interesting story from Israel is that the Israeli Defence Force, IDF, has admitted psychological warfare against the Israeli population. Uh, they opened fake, me fake social media accounts during the uh, op last operation in Gaza in order to manipulate uh, 
the view of the Israeli public into supporting uh, the, uh, the the military operations. Um, maybe we'll see something similar uh, being run uh, against the British population concerning the war in the Ukraine. I think we already do. It's called 77 Brigade, amongst other things. <laughs> but anyway, let's move on, uh, David, to education. Yes, so we have here a Tory MP speaking out, um, um, uh, Miriam Cates. She wants a full inquiry into relationship and sex education. Um, and she's concerned about the uh, widespread uh, use of age inappropriate material. Now, this is a significant point because this has been a campaign, a grassroots campaign in Scotland, England, Ireland and Wales. And we've reported it on the UK column uh, by, by parents and, and, and others against the nature of sex education in the schools and the fact that it's essentially um, an application of queer theory and it's an attack on the family, an attack on society. Um, this, has been, this grassroots campaign has been sufficiently successful that we're now seeing MPs taking up, bravely, taking up the, uh, taking up the case and asking some questions. Uh, the Express report here can, um, uh, can, continues, former teacher Miss Crates uh, told MPs that children were receiving graphic lessons on X-rated subjects um, and were being taught that there is an almost limitless number of genders. Um, she said, quote, we must make it incumbent on all schools to publish the RSE lessons, plans and resources so parents can see what is being taught and make informed decisions about whether they want to use their legal right to withdraw their children from sex education. Um, and we have here a statement from her um, and going into this in more detail, which we'll just let people um, uh, read on the screen if they want to freeze frame that as we're a bit short of time. Uh, and we'll move on to the other aspect of this. Uh, I give you the Educational Institute of Scotland, the EIS. This is a trade union of most Scottish school teachers. Um, they are warning over toxic misinformation over trans rights. Um, so they, this, this misinformation theme is whenever um, they're losing the argument, we see it from government as well, and they want to close people down. So they've warned about inaccurate information being lobbied towards schools regarding transgender pupils and the Gender Recognition Reform Bill, uh, the bill that was so controversial it brought down Nicola Sturgeon. But this trade union is still supporting it. The EIS has got is right behind it. Um, the union said it's supportive of self-declaration system for gender recognition. So 14-year-old boy decides he's a girl, that's fine. Nothing else needs to be asked. And has observed a rise in toxic debate and misinformation around the proposed changes and the existing rights of transgender people. So if you question this, if you think, no, I'm not happy with this, this is a huge change in how we're bringing up our children, this needs to be thought about, this needs to be examined, this needs to be critically explored. No, that's toxic. You can't say that because it's toxic in the view of the EIS. Um, uh, STV uh, report continues. Um, this, the EIS said the bill would have a major uh, impact on improving the well-being, they can't define that, but still, well-being and dignity of trans people, and states that risks to women's equality and safety are not the fault of trans people. So, the fault of who? Uh, uh, and the people who will exploit this, not real trans people, is it like socialism? It's never real socialism. Anyway, this comes from um, the EIS have issued a, a, a guidance document. I've got a few quotes here. Um, this is the briefing um, on guidance and supporting on supporting transgender pupils in schools. EIS advises, when a young person approaches you to discuss their gender identity, they've often taken a long time to consider who to talk to, and are looking for an adult to listen and be supportive. Uh, coming out can be beneficial, I'm not sure what coming out's got to do with it. Anyway, coming out can be beneficial for young people's well-being, as it allows them to discuss how they feel and get the support they need at the earliest point possible. A school staff member may be the first person a young person speaks to. This is, this is telling teachers to put these young people, to endorse everything they say and put them on the, on the path to the whole gender uh, transformation clinics, puberty blockers, mutilating surgery, the whole lot. We're seeing the lawsuits for, for people who have been through this process and have realised they were betrayed by the people they should have been able to rely on to help them. Um, but the EIS doesn't see, that, see it that way. Uh, they say, uh, treat sensitive personal information about pupils with respect and confidentiality. 
and don't disclose it unless required to do so by your employer or by law. I think that means don't tell the parents. And they say recognise that they are so that the, 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 the teachers must recognise that they are a role model and therefore should be aware of the potentially serious impact which any demonstration by you of intolerance or prejudice could have upon your standing as a teacher and your fitness to teach. That one, I think, is a threat. Um, and then they go and they say, well, look, so you've got, um, you've got boys who decide they're, they're girls and, and vice versa. And they say there's a difference in the service and activity between boys and girls. Transgender people should be treated according to their gender identity if they're non-binary on the basis that they have a choice and this might alter from time to time. So if a school activity is divided between boys and girls, a transgender boy should be treated as a standard with the rest of the boys. So this is, this is uh, biological males entering female spaces is being endorsed by the EIS. Um, and they, they are going to say that if you've got um, a, a problem where the, the physical differences might might um, generate safety issues. They say that that can be an exemption, but this exemption would not be applicable to physical activity, PE or sports in schools. And uh, just quickly to look at who, the, who they're then pointing people to uh, get advice from, LGBT Youth Scotland, which we've followed extensively because there's a whole series of, ch of sexual abuse cases surrounding that organisation. Mermaids, a highly controversial uh, charity, the National Gen Gender Identity Clinical Network for Scotland, Stonewall, uh, the, the, the um, gay activist group, um, are the people they're pointing, uh, they're pointing the teachers to for further advice. So the point I want to make here is the EIS has utterly surrendered to the neo-Marxist attack, the, the, the gender theory attack on society. They are not resisting this at all. They are endorsing and supporting every aspect of it. They are entirely fallen, and it, it is now relying, we're now going to rely on individual teachers, individual head teachers, and most of all on parents to push it back against this agenda and protect the children from the harm that that's going to cause. Now, one of the things that's controlling what teachers and particularly head teachers do is the inspection regime. And we have a terribly sad story here. A head teacher killed herself after news of a low Ofsted rating. This is Ruth Perry. Um, and she was told that Caversham Primary School in Reading would be downgraded from exceptional to inadequate. So from the top level to the bottom level. Um, and this was the, the, the lady, the lady very sadly took her life. Um, and her family reports that it was all to do with the Ofsted inspection. Her sister, uh, Julia Waters, said Perry had described the inspection in November last year as the worst day of her life. She said Perry had been an absolute shadow of her former self while waiting on the report's publication. Um, and they isolated her from her family. They, there was no support network for this lady. She was isolated from any professional, familial uh, or pastoral support despite the, the, the severity of the, the event she'd gone through. Uh, the Guardian completes here, the offset report said the school leaders did not have the required knowledge to keep pupils safe from harm. This was based on a one-day inspection. Uh, Matthew Purvis, Ofsted's regional director for South East, said we are deeply saddened by Ruth Perry's tragic death. Our thoughts remain with Mrs Perry's family, friends, and everyone at Car Caversham Primary School community. They are not taking any responsibility, obviously, for the events. Um, this has now produced a major a pushback, and we see here a head teacher has actually, at least temporarily, refused Ofsted entry to the school um, after uh, after this event. Um, uh, Flora Cooper, executive head teacher, John Rankin Schools in uh, Newbury in Berkshire, uh, announced today she would not let inspectors inside the school, adding she's doing this for school staff everywhere. Now she subsequently was forced to recant on that and and um, received a lot of pressure and probably not enough support but there are other pushbacks uh, teachers are now wearing black armbands um, to commemorate the, the, the head teacher who, 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 who sadly took her life um, when they're in, engaging with Ofsted inspectors and apparently they're also sometimes starting the engagement with Ofsted inspections 
uh, with a minute silence. Um, so they are pushing back in other ways, but they're being prevented from pushing back more firmly by the management system in the local councils who are giving them no support. So I think parents who look at this and are concerned need to be taking this up with their councillors that they should be supporting the teachers and actually protecting them from this sort of um, aggressive inspection, which has reached a point where it's now costing, it would appear, lives. OK, David, and then just one final thing on the Scottish Union for Education. Uh, I just pointed this out, Scottish Union for Education, this is newsletter six, from, uh, it includes an article by Stuart Wayton, friend of UK column, and Richard Lucas, UK column contributor. Um, this um, newsletter is the best thing out there on education. Um, whether you're in Scotland or not, if you're interested in education and what's happening in schools, you should sign up for the Scottish Union of Education newsletter. There are, there are three or four excellent articles each week. It's very thoughtful stuff, very good contributors, and quite the best thing on education I've seen. Brilliant. Excellent. OK, well, thank you to everybody for joining UK Column News today. I think it's been a really educational news because, of course, all of us are paying attention to what's being said. So it's not only our audience that is learning. The UK Column team always learn from a news programme. So let's put it in those terms. Um, just before we close, I would like to say that um, the unit I couldn't remember the uh, in connection with the Israeli Defence Force was Unit 8. 200, not 4200, and that is the Israeli equivalent effectively of the US NSA. Um, and it was Francis Maud who was one of the key figures when this inter integration uh, between uh, UK intelligence and the Israeli systems took place. And UK Column reported that way back in 2016. We'll bring it to the surface again so that we can have a look at how it fits in with the picture today. And lastly, I just want to give a, a little mention to the ladies in public retention Wales um, who've been doing such good work to challenge this perverse teaching in schools that uh, David's just been alluding to. Um, so Lou Collins from Liberty Tactics is going to be working with the ladies to do another 24-hour pod-a-thon in order to raise money. We'll make sure that we give you details of that because much as with Sandy Adams, it's great to see uh, these ladies standing up to challenge the system. Uh, we'll be back in a couple of minutes for some extra. Thank you for joining us. Bye-bye.